All right, so we're starting a new unit, and this new unit will be on um, electing a president, um, political parties, uh, how elections work, um, the president himself, and the powers that the president has, him or herself, I guess. So I shared with you the note guide. Um, you can print that off, or you can take the notes you know, just online with that. That's up to you. As always, you don't have to turn that note guide in. However, uh, the plan is if we get back to school that we will be taking a normal test over this unit when we get back. Hopefully that goes well. Um, let's start today with how our electoral college works. We elect presidents different than we elect any other person. Uh, any other position in the United States for governor, senator, member of the House, you know, school board elect elections, all those things, whoever gets the most votes wins. That's called popular vote. If 50 people vote for me and 20 people vote for you, then I win. I get the most popular votes. But we don't do that with electing a president. With electing a president, we use an electoral college where we actually vote for people who then vote for us. So let's watch this short video, first of all on how the Electoral College works. I think it's about a three-minute video. What is the Electoral College? In a nutshell, it is a layer of bureaucracy between your vote and who becomes president. At the Constitutional Convention in 1787, the Founding Fathers were trying to devise a balanced way to elect a president. They didn't want the president to be selected solely by a group of political elites like Congress or the state legislature, and they were a little terrified at the idea of a direct popular election, since there was no telling who the idiot masses might pick. So they came up with a compromise, the Electoral College. Each state has electors in the college equal to the number of members it has in Congress. Every state has two senators and a delegation in the House of Representatives based on its population. Since California is the largest state, it has the most representatives with 53, plus two senators, and that gives it 55 electors. Whereas Hawaii only has two representatives and two senators, giving it four electors. Even though it has no representatives at all, Washington, D.C. also gets three electors. That gives us a grand total of 538 possible electoral votes. Each political party has its own slate of electors. 538 Democrat electors, 538 Republican, 538 for the Green Party, and so on. The selection of these electors is controlled by the political parties and how they are chosen varies state to state. When you place your vote in November, you aren't actually voting for the president. You are voting for an elector from your district who represents the political party of your candidate. In all but two states, this is a winner-take-all system, meaning that if the majority of a state's districts vote for one candidate, it, all of the state electors in that candidate's political party get to vote. So a candidate who wins the majority in New York State will get all 29 of their electors in that state. This winner-take-all system was not how the process was originally envisioned by the founders, but rather a change in the state law made in an effort by party leaders to maximize support for their preferred candidate. Once one state went this route, the rest quickly followed. All except Nebraska and Maine, where the state winner gets two electors, and the winner of each congressional district receives one elector. This system allows electors to be awarded to more than one candidate, and some may argue is a much better way of representing the population's vote than a winner-take-all model. Or maybe not, since the districts of many states have been totally mangled through gerrymandering, which are political campaigns to rearrange legislative districts to make sure they reliably vote one way or the other. Regardless, once all the votes are in and the electors from each state have been determined, those electors then go and vote for their pledge delegate. A majority of 270 electoral votes is required to elect the president. Theoretically, this system was originally intended to allow electors to act as independent actors and determine whether the public was truly choosing a worthy president. And so, there is no constitutional provision or federal law requiring electors to vote according to the results of the popular vote in their states. However, throughout our history as a nation, more than 99% of electors have voted as pledged. And though there have been electors who broke ranks as recently as the 2000 election, their votes have never influenced the outcome of a presidential election. Actually, the 2016 election, there were some what we call faithless electors. We'll get into that in another day. Okay, so let's summarize this. Let me get this back to full screen again here. This is an electoral college map as of 2020. Or, excuse me, this was uh, from 2010 through 2020. It will change again with redistricting because, remember, um, 
the total seats that someone that each state has in the electoral college is somewhat based on the House of Representatives. So as the House of Representatives, like if, if Texas would pick up two more seats in the House, then they would also get two more electoral votes. But you notice these are the electoral votes um, that each state has. So how does this work? Well, let me give you a quick summary again. Okay, when you vote for president, your ballot looks something like this. And I'll show you the actual ballot here. Uh, if you, in the last election, if you voted for Clinton, there had been three electors that were mentioned there. Then actually those electors would be chosen. Or if you voted for Trump, you're choosing these electors. So let's say South Dakota, we voted for Trump uh, in November. Well, then the electors actually cast their vote in December, in mid-December. And those three electors, Ann, Bill, and Chad, then cast their vote for president. Ann, Bill, and Chad could vote for Clinton, even though they were Trump electors. Now, they don't do that. You saw in that film that 99% of the electors vote the way the people have chosen, but they can. And that's part of the reason of the Electoral College. The, electoral co the, the founders were a little concerned about if the people were, I guess, qualified enough to choose a leader. Remember, this was a completely new system. So they wanted some way of, some kind of go-between, some kind of safeguard in case the people chose somebody really bad. The electors then could, in their better judgment, choose a better candidate. Now, it hasn't worked out that way. Uh, ever. I mean, we've never chosen a different candidate than what the people would have, but nonetheless, that is what the system, uh, how it was created, and, and that was a reason for it. And we will look at another day of some of the problems that's created. Okay, so this was the actual 2016 ballot. Um, it wasn't just President Trump versus Hillary Clinton, at least not in South Dakota. South Dakota, we had uh, four candidates. If you voted for Trump, Trump and Pence, these were your electors. Now, electors are, would, would be from the party, but they cannot be members of Congress. So Dennis Dugard was our governor, um, and these are high-ranking Democrat or Republicans. Excuse me. Hillary Clinton chose these three people as electors uh, in South Dakota. So Trump won the, the popular vote in November of 2016, and these three electors then cast their vote for President Trump uh, in mid-December. They actually choose the president. We choose the electors. So let's get some of the details down, you know, specifics. All right, so there's a total of 538 total electoral votes. Okay, um, each state gets the number the same number of electoral votes as they have members of Congress. So every state has two members of Senate, and every state has at least one member of the House. So the very minimum amount of electoral votes you can get is three. And South Dakota has the smallest amount. Obviously, if you're a larger state, if you have 20 people in the House and two senators, you would have 22. So the bigger the states, the more populated the states, the more electors they have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 538... Uh, if you add those numbers up, if there's 435 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate, that should be 535. Um, but then the District of Columbia also gets three electoral votes. You need a majority of electoral votes to be elected president. Now, today, a majority is 270. If we ever add more members of the House, then that would change the Electoral College total, and that number 270 would change too. But it's been 270 for a long time. So... But the majority is correct. Now, the majority is different than the most. The most we refer to as a plurality. So if somebody has the most votes, that's not good enough. Okay, so you need a majority. And let's say we have three candidates and one gets 45% of the vote, another one 35, and the last one gets the rest. Well, nobody got a majority because the most someone got is 45%. That's not good enough. You have to have a majority. If you don't get a majority... The Constitution says the House of Representatives chooses the president. And that's happened twice in American history. Thomas Jefferson was chosen by the House of Representatives, and so was John Quincy Adams. Now, it hasn't happened since 1824. However, it is possible that no one will get a majority of electoral votes. Since we've kind of evolved into a two-party system, uh, that is unlikely today. 
the Electoral College doesn't vote in November. So when we watch the the returns on the votes in November, like on Election Day, and they say, you know, President Trump won the presidency, he really had not. We just assume that the electors will vote for him. But really, we don't know who's going to be president until the electors formalize it in mid-December. We just know that the electors will vote the way the people vote uh, because they have in the United States. Now, this is kind of a strange system, and, and on another day we'll look at the issues, the problems with the Electoral College, but you got to remember that when when their country was founded, there weren't other democracies in the world. There wasn't places where people chose their leader. You were a leader because you were a dictator, because you controlled the army and, and you kept power because of your strength, or you were a leader because uh, you were a king or a queen, and, and you only were a king or a queen because your mom or dad was was a queen or a king. Um, but that's how you get the power. Nobody had said, hey, let's let the people choose. So we decided, or our founders decided, you know, if we're going to let the people choose, we better have some kind of safeguard. What if the system doesn't work? What if they choose somebody that's bad? So it was a safeguard against uneducated voters, against if the, the system itself didn't work. Now, Democracies work all over the world. Uh, we no longer need this in. And on, again, on another day, probably tomorrow, we will look at the issues that the Electoral College has created. Um, but it is our system and there's no, uh, no um, push to change it. So that is how our Electoral College system works. That, how, that is how we elect a president. We do not elect anybody else that way. Only presidents are elected through the Electoral College.